So the other day, I saw this bus stop ad for coconut water. And it basically read, our planet is dying. You should be panicking. Our coconut water is sustainable. Buy our coconut water. And if that isn't a sign of the times, I don't know what is. Buying coconut water isn't going to save our environment. And maybe we shouldn't exactly be panicking, but we should be reacting to the environmental crises we face today with a sense of urgency. I mean, if you step on a Lego, you don't need to call an ambulance, usually, but you shouldn't just stand there like some heartless cyborg either. Yet reflecting on the past few decades, it feels like collectively, as a society, we've been standing on Legos. Our healthcare system has been in serious need of reform for years. Financial inequality continues to worsen. Human rights violations continue to plague our society. And the environment which we depend on has been so carelessly neglected that the future of our species on this planet is now in jeopardy. But rather than resigning ourselves to this daunting minefield of existential Legos, we should acknowledge the pain they cause and use them to build something beautiful. And if we're going to build a healthy, equitable world, we need to start with a sturdy foundation. And that means cleaning up our green Legos and rethinking our relationship with the environment. And what is that relationship? Well, the environment is our home. And we know this intuitively. From the moment we're born, we're surrounded with images of animals and forests, not skyscrapers and highways. We refer to Mother Nature, not Mother Manhattan. Yet the way we've treated our home, this environment that supports us, has been shameful. We've gutted our house and turned the front lawn into a landfill. We rip and burn through forests filled with biodiversity, replacing them with a few choice crops or turning them into graze land for livestock. And when we do this, we lose the gifts that Mother Nature gives us. We lose our health, natural medicines, clean air and water. We lose our lungs, trees and plant life that produce oxygen and filter greenhouse gases and carbon. We lose our pollinators, the tiny flying farmers that work diligently asking nothing in return. And these losses create chain reactions that damage our oceans and threaten to throw a relatively stable climate into a state of unpredictable chaos. It snowed in Texas. We've had such a profound impact on our planet that we're now entering a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, named unflatteringly by us, for us. Now, on the other hand, this is the Anthropocene. In a literal sense, this is our time. Now, our species may have become a force of nature, but it's up to us to decide what legacy we want to leave on this planet. And now, changing the legacy of a species is no easy task, and we can't expect to do so on empty stomachs. So let's start by thinking how we can reform our unsustainable agricultural system. Human agriculture has claimed 37% of the land on this planet, and only 25% of this planet remains wild. 92% of all fresh water available to humans is used in agricultural processes. And these agricultural processes generate massive amounts of greenhouse gases and play huge roles in contributing to the pollution of our air, land, and water. Now, despite such a monolithic industry, a conservative estimate of around 800 million individuals worldwide are currently starving or malnourished. 
And if this is the case today, with a population of 7 billion, how are we going to feed the roughly 9.8 billion individuals who will share this planet by 2050? Well, it's expected that around 70% of that 9.8 billion will be living in cities. And luckily, cities make a great setting for a uniquely sustainable form of agriculture. But in our current form of agriculture, cities pose massive environmental and logistical problems. See, every day, crops grown on remote farms need to be loaded onto gas-guzzling, refrigerated 18-wheelers and shipped long distances to their destinations in cities. Now, even in the best case scenario, this results in massive losses due to waste. So you can still look fresh if it takes a week for your pair of Crocs to be delivered to your door, but if you wait that long for veggies to ship, some of them are sure to spoil. And this isn't just an environmental and waste-related problem, this creates a public health nightmare. The costs associated with growing, packaging, refrigerating, and transporting fresh veggies to cities means that they almost always end up in grocery stores in affluent neighborhoods where consumers can afford to pay top dollar for a head of lettuce. And in this country, for every single grocery store, there are five fast food joints. And what this means is that most low-income communities exist in food deserts, areas where the only nutritional options available are highly processed junk foods. For individuals living in these communities, the choice between buying a calorie-dense meal from the dollar menu or three apples for $3 from Whole Foods isn't a choice between eating unhealthy or healthy. It's a choice between not starving and starving. It's no wonder, then, why we see such high rates of malnutrition, obesity, and cardiovascular disease in our populations. So what role can cities play in agriculture? Well, grocery chains aren't about to lower their prices and set up shop in low-income communities. So we need to come up with ways to produce healthy food locally and sustainably. Now, my mom produces some food locally. If you're hungry, you can step out back, grab a few tomatoes, and make a homemade sauce. And if pesto's more your thing, we've got basil too. If you're thirsty, or Zoom fatigued, you can put some mint to good use in a mojito. This is urban agriculture in its simplest form. And while my mom's humble home garden can't feed an entire community, if we all pitch in and get our hands dirty, we just might be able to. Because we've done it before. During World War II, the US government needed enough food to feed both its civilian population and its military. So it implemented a massive campaign encouraging citizens to start their own victory gardens in local parks or in their backyards. And this message was received so well that nearly 40% of the nation's fresh veggies at the time were produced by community and home gardeners. As food insecurity continues to grow worse, accelerated by the disruptive effects of the ongoing pandemic, we need to come together as a community to start and support our own victory gardens. And at a time where we are seemingly more divided and disconnected than ever, community gardening offers us the opportunity to shut off our laptops, stretch our legs, breathe some fresh air, and work together under a common cause that we can feel and taste. And while low-income communities may lack access to fresh, healthy veggies, 
what they often don't lack are vacant lots. And looking at these gray, empty spaces as opportunities for literal growth can transform food deserts into lush oases. Now we need to support and empower these communities to achieve food sovereignty. And this change needs to come from the bottom up and not from the top down. But why stop at community gardens when we're thinking about urban agriculture? What other ways are there for cities to produce healthy food locally and sustainably? Well, one way is through hydroponics. Now, the term hydroponics comes from two Greek words. Hydro, meaning, you guessed it, water, and phonos, meaning labor. So hydroponics is a way to grow food using only nutrient-enriched water and light. And while the cost of this technology may be expensive, it pays for itself in the long run. Hydroponic systems use less space, fewer energy inputs, and produce far greater yields than conventional farming. And because these systems don't require natural sunlight, they can be used to produce food year-round indoors. So what does this look like in the real world? Well, some grocery stores are starting to outfit their rooftops with hydroponic greenhouses, irrigating their crops with 100% recycled water and growing their food on site. And at the same time, these greenhouses act like beanies for buildings, trapping excess heat and thereby offsetting heating costs. Now, restaurants are starting to use this technology in similar ways to redefine what farm to table means. And if you're worried about pesticides ending up on your broccoli, these systems can leverage symbiotic insect populations that work as 24-7 gardeners. Schools in food insecure communities are using hydroponic systems to create delicious learning opportunities, growing healthy cafeteria meals in bio class. And new circular business models are sprouting in places like Chicago, where a brewery and a coffee roaster can unite and operate under the same roof as an indoor farm, encouraging them to rethink how they can make their waste productive. Spent grain and coffee grounds can be put to use as compost rather than ending up in the trash and excess carbon dioxide from the brewing process can be used to boost plant growth in that same indoor farm. And this is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the application of hydroponic systems. Now, greening our cities, whether through high-tech hydroponic systems or grassroots community gardening, tackles food insecurity. And at the same time, it fosters a sense of environmental stewardship in city dwellers who, at the moment, have been alienated from nature. See, we can't expect people to care, to care about dirt and grass if all they see is concrete and glass. And urban agriculture opens the doors for nature to re-enter our gray cityscapes. And while urban agriculture may not be advanced enough yet to produce avocados in New York, the time is ripe to rethink the role that cities can play in our agricultural system. So far, the Anthropocene has been defined by destructive industry, including agribusiness. But the Anthropocene doesn't have to be about how humanity destroyed nature. It can be about how people reinvented nature, reinvented agriculture, and learned to appreciate and nurture nature even in cities.
So, if you're feeling anxious about the future of the environment, if you're zoomed out or feeling disconnected, or if you're just tired of standing on Legos, get outside and grow something in your community. Find a local community garden or start one yourself. Just food for thought. Thank you.